Welcome back, everyone, to this continuation of Luke Live Online. I'm Father James Deluzio with commentary on Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, most often referred to as the prodigal son, but really more accurately about a disobedient son, a forgiving father, and a resentful older brother. All right, so you know the themes. The primary one that's been preached for centuries and that has made this particular parable well known well beyond Christianity itself. It's ultimately about the magnanimity of God, how love forgiveness pours forth from God and to trust in God's forgiveness. But it's also, on other levels, helping us explore our defiance our defiance against God, our defiance against social norms and the Ten Commandments and how real that defiance can be for us at times. And it's also about resentment and looking over our shoulder at what other people are getting away with. And a little more than that as well. So let's take a look and benefit from some of the new commentaries that I've been reading. One of them from Dr. Amy Jill Levine. She is a Jewish scholar of the Christian scriptures. And she, and along with many others these days, are finding much, much more about the Judaism of Jesus, the Judaism at the time of Jesus, because of the Christian Testament. And she offers many really sound insights into what's really going on for Jesus and the people who are listening to him at the t very time before these stories were even written down and then passed on to future generations, first of Jews and then ultimately to Gentiles as well. Uh, we also, I also have some insights by a, a Protestant uh, reverend, uh, Brian McLaren, who now works with Father Franciscan Father Richard Rohr in the Center for Action and Contemplation, and a few others, but those are the two most recent ones uh, that I'd like to share with you. Okay, so first of all, as soon as Jesus begins the parable, a man had two sons right away. His fellow Jews would have said, oh, this is going to be a good story, because they would recall immediately two sets of famous brothers. The first, Cain and Abel, right? And the second, Jacob and Esau. You remember Jacob and Esau are the sons of Isaac and Rebekah, and Rebekah favors the younger one, Jacob, which isn't supposed to happen because you're supposed to favor the oldest son. And when the older son is supposed to get his blessing from Isaac, she substitutes her son Jacob, puts a hairy shirt on him because Esau's really hairy. He's a wild man. But Jacob is the more meek and younger one. But Jacob gets the blessing from the father and Esau is furious. Jacob goes away for 14 years, comes back and really doesn't know what Esau's going to do with him because Esau was in a rage when he left. But we have this powerful story of Esau's forgiveness of his brother Esau embraces um, his brother Jacob. The, uh, Father Isaac and Re mother Re Rebecca are far gone already. Powerful story. So they're set. They're set for something really neat like this. And so two sons. Okay, Jesus, so let's go ahead. And then he says, the younger son. Ah, the younger son. Well, this is, we're going to get this. The younger son is going to outdo the older son. We like this. It's a nice break from the status quo. Uh, not that everything is the older son gets all the inheritance, gets all the favors. Good, good. This is an important aspect of our relationship with God and our understanding of ourselves. Now, suddenly something goes a bit amiss because this younger son lives a life of dissipation, is disrespectful to the father. Well, wait a minute. They're thinking, this shouldn't go quite this way. Not if we're thinking of Jacob and Esau, Jacob being the younger. But then they'll start thinking, well, you know, uh, uh, Cain and Abel, Abel was the younger. God loved Abel more, or so the story tells us. Uh, but yet, it's interesting, because remember, Cain kills the brother, but God does not take revenge or vengeance on Cain, but rather protects Cain, so he has time to take the consequences of his actions, to ponder it. And God forbids anybody to put Cain to death, even though he murdered his brother. So, oh, maybe we're going to get one of these stories about 
God's patience and God's forgiveness, even for uh, even for the sinners, even for murderers. So they're, they'll be really intrigued. And then we go a little further as Jesus tells the story, and he tells us that the son gets in trouble, is totally dissip uh, he lives a life of dissipation. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Later we find out prostitutes are involved, but we only get that from the older brother. How did he know? What did he hear? I guess he was listening to rumors. <laughs> Gossip about his younger brother. Well, all the same. So they're hearing this, and then lo and behold, perhaps like Cain, we don't know, um, he's really not particularly contrite. He connives to go back to his father when things are really bad, but he, he's we're working out how he can work it, you know, how he can impress his father. Oh, I no longer uh, deserve to be your son. I've sinned against heaven. How sincere is this repentance? But then we get, again, we get that powerful statement. Our orientation is insignificant when paired with the love forgiveness of God. Remember, I like to point out love forgiveness from God. It's all one word, and it's we're meant to emulate and embrace that. You can't have love without forgiveness in this world. You can't have forgiveness without love. So, okay, they're good. They're thinking, wonderful. We've got... Uh, we've got what we believe. But then Jesus brings attention to the resentful and older brother. And then for all of us, Jew and Gentile alike, we think, oh no, this story isn't so much about them and our ideas about uh, love and God's love forgiveness. It's also about our resentment that this love forgiveness is for everybody. Yes, we know that. That's our tradition, but it does make us uncomfortable. And that's really the thrust what Jesus wants us to really get into. Why, why do we resent what's um, offered to others? Why do we keep our looking over our shoulder? Why do we keep comparing ourselves to others? The father's answer to the angry son is very important. He says, you'll always be with me. For our fellow Jews, well, we always have the covenant. Even if Christians are going to be added to us and forgiven for all the things they do to others, to us. But, hey, we can remember we always have our covenant. We'll always be with God. And everything God has is ours. Well, we have many blessings from God. Why are we counting the blessings he's giving to others? That's, that's a trap of people of Christianity, of every religion under the sun. So this is really a universal story. And so we have um, that contemplation. And then the truth, the truth of the real situation in the story is the older brother really has lost nothing. He's lost nothing. He still has his half of the estate. His brother has lost it, will forever be indebted to the father. And when the father dies, do his brother, if he wants to have a livelihood still from this form, he doesn't get anything more than love forgiveness, which in itself is meant to be enough to be good. But on practical levels, he's still lost a lot. There's still consequences for his uh, swallowing up the property with prostitutes. And so the older one is asked to work through the resentment with a sense of gratitude for what he has rather than what he doesn't have. But we also get an advice to parents. Pay attention to the loyal kid. It's true. You do have to go after the lost ones. And it's true. We all know this from our own family experience. The lost sheep, the black sheep of our families seem to get a lot more attention because they're hurt, they're wounded, they're confused, they're angry, they're giving in to their resentment or whatever. Uh, but so it's saying, parents, don't forget the faithful child. Make sure that they're affirmed 